Oh, whew. Ha, oh man. Whew. And I almost blew, blew your brains out. And you gotta be careful when you sneak up on a man like that. Or maybe I should be more careful and not sleep when there's cows around, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, why don't you come on, come on down here and have a seat and we'll have a little talk. Uh, all right, well, let's get settled in. Appreciate you coming by today. Now, what are we, what are we gonna talk about today? Today, I'd like to have a little discussion about the most common items that are gonna be present along the, present along the frontier as far as things that are in, uh, in the settlers and the frontiersmen's and the hunters' packs. Now, where do we get this information? Obviously, there's a lot of books written about this stuff. There's a lot of people online and a lot of reenactors and people from rendezvous um, that are portraying and carrying around this gear and reading about this gear. But the place we need to go are the primary documents, and those are going to be um, like the journals, the Journal of Nicholas Cresswell. He was an Englishman who came to America and tried to seek his fortune, but it didn't turn out so well for him. But he did. He did travel around, along the Virginia and Kentucky frontier. We got people like Daniel Tribu. Uh, he was a man in his young 20s who also went to Kentucky, the Kentucky frontier, and participated in some of the very climactic battles in some of those some of those events in the late 1780s. So we have first-hand accounts similar to those, but then we also have, have ledgers and lists of items that were carried, that were bought, purchased, and carried by traders, by hunters. So we have a lot of lists of those, and the place that I found to go that's going to have a good bit of that information is Ted Ballou's book, The Hunters of Kentucky, and he has some appendixes in the back where it has lists of items that were found in, in those ledgers uh, and that were carried by traders and by hunters. Now, by far, probably the most prevalent item or category of items that I've seen in those ledgers and that's talked about in those books are weaponry. So they talk a lot about their smoothbores, they talk a lot about carrying their rifles and obviously the items to supply so powder lead flints those are all mentioned constantly not only in the ledgers but whenever uh, let's just say when daniel tribute is talking about he's gonna make a trip to a fort or he's gonna go back east he always talks about they had a, they had good guns they had powder and they had lead and what about other weapons? Well, the other two, the other two predominant type of weapons that are mentioned are the trade knife, so a basic type of basic butcher knife style. And this one's a little bit large, but four of them would have been in the six to seven inch range. So this one has a nine inch blade and is a little bit large, but I like this knife a lot. So knives would have been something that would have been carried around by those hunters and those settlers. As well as tomahawks. So these tomahawks are not that were these tomahawks that were carried were not gigantic, slightly smaller axes. What we're looking at here is something with a very lightweight head with a very small cutting head and the handle could be longer or shorter depending upon the preference of the user. And from what I understand, these were not primarily meant to be, these were primarily used as weapons and not as much used as wood processing tools as we do today. The type of metal and the type of steel and iron that they used back then was not nearly as tough and durable as the, as the much more uniform type of steel that we have today. So essentially, those older, oh, those hand-forged tomahawks were, were delicate. And when you came in, to, if you're gonna come and cut down a four or five inch tree with one of these, you might risk damaging your tomahawk, one of your primary weapons. So when, when we read about these, it's far more likely that they're carrying these as a tool, excuse me, it's far more likely that, that the people, the frontiersmen and settlers and hunters that are carrying these are more using them as a weapon rather than purely a tool. So the tool is going to be a secondary purpose for processing smaller pieces of wood. 
All right, as we move on, we're gonna go ahead and dig into our haversack. Now, us here in the 21st century, we have so many options. We have outfitters, we have sporting and swords that we can go to, and we can get gear and equipment specific for the outdoors. And well, 18th century folks didn't have a Bass Pro Shop, so they didn't have an REI, so they weren't able to go and buy outdoor specific items. So what they would have done is they would have used either a lot of some of those items that were used in the Indian trade, or they would have just used the items that they got from home. So one of the other items that's talked about are kettles. So something, a container that you can boil or cook in. So I have two different styles here and I have a lid for this one. Ah, here it is. So I have two different styles here. So this is, this is a, a fantastic reproduction, very, very durable, and it's tinned on the inside, completely watertight. And then we have this one, which is a brass kettle, no lid, you can make a wooden one, and it's also tinned on the inside. So this is something that's more likely gonna be an item that was swiped from some housewife's kitchen and is now being used in uh, woods or militia duty. Now this design of kettle is gonna be an item that's gonna be far more found uh, by in the use of Indians or by the use of somebody who's come in contact with, with traders. So both of, these, both of these kettles are fantastic options. This one obviously holds a little bit more. This one's smaller, but it does have a lid. And this one fits in my haversack while this one's got a ride in the bedroll. Now I was reading Daniel Tribu's account last night and he specifically mentioned that they had steel for making fire. Now that's gonna mean that they're gonna have some sort of, uh, some sort of hard rock that's gonna be able to spark and also the, the steel that's gonna make the sparks. And Daniel Tribune mentioned that he had a kit, a fire making kit. So what we have to assume is that he had some sort of charred material. And obviously this is a, a tinned container, so we can't char the material in this one, but we can char material in other ways, which we'll cover in another video coming very soon. And what else do we have in here? We've got some pieces of fat wood. I've got a candle, a lump of beeswax in there, the striker, and all of this rolls up. And I can't find the, I guess that's it. But we also got some hemp toe in there. So we roll that up. And this is an oil, this is a greased bag. So this is gonna be pretty stinking water resistant. Unless it's in the water for a couple hours and it's probably soaking. And we just tie it up in there. And I also have another emergency tender bag in my haversack as well. Now, what about stuff to tie things together? What about rope? I haven't come across rope a whole bunch in my research. Now, they do talk about linen thread, but one thing that they would definitely have are leather strap, well, small leather straps or leather tugs for tying things together. So I've tried, I don't always, I don't have a lot of access to a lot of raw deer, elk, or bison hides right now. So I just, I cut out pieces of uh, thin strips of leather, oil them, and they become very strong. So rope, you can definitely carry some. I mean, they had it. It was very prevalent in the 18th century. But on the frontier, I have seen a lot more references to leather tugs. All right, now on to the last item. So we've got my tump line here. And we have a small bedroll. I have a twin size wool blanket in here covered by a piece of oil cloth. Now the the thing about oil cloth is that I don't think I've ever read or seen documentation, maybe once, I'm not sure though, but I can't remember a single instance of reading people who are on foot carry oil cloth. Now people who are in large parties of hunters, people that are traveling down a river or a body of water in a canoe or a flat boat. Yeah. Yeah, if you've got horses or canoes, you're gonna be able to have the, the space and the ability to transport such a heavy item. 
So this is a piece of five by seven oil cloth. And it's um, this isn't the lightweight stuff. This is the heavy, heavy stuff. And inside of it, I've got a wool blanket. Now the wool blankets are talked about constantly. Another thing Daniel Tribune mentions having on his trip, on one of his trips, are good wool blankets. And he mentions that in the middle of winter and obviously it's gonna be really important to be able to have some good wool blankets to be able to keep you warm. And remember, wool keeps you warm even when it's wet and it also can repel water. Now remember, a wool blanket is not a substitute for a waterproof or even heavily water resistant covering. But if you're gonna carry one, it seems like, well, at least the, the wool blankets were far more prevalent on the 18th century Kentucky frontier. So make of that what you will. Oil cloth, yes, it 100% existed. It was used, it was used for cover, it was used for tarps, it was used for coverings. But those wool blankets, they're talked about constantly. They're in those ledgers. They're in the records of what people carried on hunts and what was traded for. And remember, we're not doing this to survive. We're doing, this is a hobby. We're doing this to have fun. And because this is a hobby, we have the ability to make or spend the money on, on period materials that's, that are going to help keep us safe and keep us alive. A lot of the people who, a lot of the accounts that we have, the people are miserable even when they have nice wool blankets and nice and the best and some of the best cold weather clothing of that time. So just keep that in mind. We're doing this for fun and you can jump into into this at basically whatever whatever level you want. If you want comfort, awesome, oil cloths. But if you want to push yourself, try using just a wool blanket. Well, I really appreciate you sitting down here with me today. I know I've had a good time. I hope you have too, and I hope you've learned something. I'm still trying to learn so much of this myself. I'm still, I'm still a neophyte, but I do my best to learn something more every day. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you down the trail in the next video. Have a great day.